So I will say to the people who are just logging on right now, it's 1.58 p.m. Eastern time. I must say we have participants all the way from London to New Zealand, so uh, grade that one on a curve. Anyway, we'll be um, starting in two minutes, so 2 p.m. sharp on Eastern time. So you'd, if you'll just wait a minute or two, all will be uh, starting. And it's 2 p.m. sharp on the dot. Hello and welcome. I'm David Randall, Director of Research of the National Association of Scholars, your moderator for our latest in our, the National Association of Scholars, American Innovations webinar series. Uh, today we are doing ENIAC, uh, the first computer um, asterisk, there are definite, different definitions, but it's a pretty good one. Um, and I'll just say the guiding questions first, which were given to our panelists. Uh, completed in 1945, ENIAC was the first programmable, electronic, general purpose digital computer of its kind. What is the story behind ENIAC's development? What was it used for? And how did it lead to further developments in the field? what made ENIAC special or the first of its kind. Uh, we accept ENIAC as a, a pronunciation too. Um, now, our panelists are uh, in alphabetical order, which will also be the order of presentation. Uh, Dr. Jack Copeland, who is Distinguished Professor in Arts at the University of Canterbury in New Zealand and Director of the Turing Archive for the History of Computer, uh, Computing, excuse me. Um, a very long series of honors um, deserved and many books, including uh, Turing, the essential Turing, um, you know, Alan Turing's electronic brain, computability, um, and you know, more stuff uh, of, of that nature. Uh, Dr. Zhao Fan is currently a postdoctoral fellow at Kobe University, funded by the Japan Society for the Promotion of Science and has also you know, received his doctorate in uh, the University of Canterbury, New Zealand under the guidance of Professor Jack Copeland and uh, Professor Diane Proudfoot, uh, works on the development of modern logic and the computer in the first half of the 20th century, focusing on the works of Turing, Gödel, uh, Wittgenstein, and von Neumann. Uh, Dr. Mark Priestley is a senior research fellow at the National Museum of Computing, um, uh, where, he has been wor working since 2019 to enhance the museum's understanding of the history of early computing and the development of programming languages. In 2019, he won the Bernard S. Finn History Prize for his article, Colossus and Programmability, published in the IEEE Annals of the History of Computing. And Dr. Raul Rojas is a professor of artificial intelligence in the Department of Mathematics and Computer Science at the Fra at Freie Universität Universität Berlin uh, from 1997 to 2020. Um, and then again, an extraordinary series of honors um, to list. Uh, some, hopefully all of their books will be put into the chat and or Q&A button at the bottom. Yes, there's the list has already been put in for people to take a look. So you can read more of their books and plug by them. Um, now, terribly honored to have them. Let me tell you a little bit about the what's how this is going to go. Um, four 12 to 14 minute conversational talks by our speakers in alphabetical order. I believe the first two are going to be more in the nature of overviews, the second two focusing on details um, of ENIAC. When that's done, 
uh, moderated Q and A. That means you, the watcher, gets to put on your questions either into chat or Q and A buttons at the bottom. I will relay them uh, to the uh, panelists who can also just choose to answer them, choose to answer one another, just generally make for a good and fun conversation. Note, if your answers, if your questions don't get answered in the course of the 90 minutes, don't worry. Uh, send email to me at randall at nas.org. I would be delighted to forward your questions to our panelists so they can have the option to answer you. And if you have to leave in the middle, don't worry. This is going to be recorded in perpetuity for the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel. So you will be able to watch this even if you have to leave suddenly. Uh, with that having been all said, I'm going to go and say, um, Professor Copeland, uh, would you be so kind? Um, yes. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you for inviting me to this um, extremely interesting event. Let me um, share my screen. I should say to start with that um, Zhao and I have perhaps slightly departed from the um, from the format that you just announced, and we're going to give a, a kind of um, a composite talk. Um, with me first and Zhao second, which is going to last about 20 minutes in total. We can't uh, see it or hear you if you are speaking. Sorry, Jack, just checking. Um, and it operated at the, from today's perspective, very low speed of 100 kilohertz. It was 100 feet in length and occupied a large room. ENIAC was a wonderful machine, the first large-scale electronic programmable digital computer to possess a wide degree of flexibility. It first ran at the end of 1945 at the Moore School of Electrical Engineering in Philadelphia, where it was built, and it was announced to the press in February 1946. As far as the media were concerned, then and later, ENIAC was the world's first electronic computer. But although few knew it at the time, ENIAC was in fact preceded by a top secret computer in Britain named Colossus. Colossus broke encrypted German radio messages. It was smaller than ENIAC, containing around 2,400 vacuum tubes as opposed to ENIAC's 17,000. The first model was switched on in January 1944 at Bletchley Park, the headquarters of British military code breaking, and Colossus was the first large-scale electronic programmable digital computer. Colossus was very successful at the job it was designed for, code breaking, but it didn't have that wide degree of flexibility that ENIAC possessed. Tom Flowers, who designed Colossus, had built into it the quite limited facilities that were needed for breaking the encrypted messages, and nothing more. Jack Good, one of the code breakers who worked with Colossus, told me that one day he tried to coax Colossus into doing long multiplication, but even that much mathematics lay beyond its ability. ENIAC, on the other hand, was a powerful mathematical engine. Another difference between these two electronic computers was that Colossus remained ultra secret for many decades, whereas ENIAC was in the public domain and sat prominently at ground zero of the modern computer age. This delightful ENIAC centric diagram was drawn by an unknown artist at the National Science Foundation in 1957. More than 60 years later, some of the detail in the diagram can certainly be challenged. But nevertheless, it succeeds in giving a general impression of ENIAC's important position in computer history. I'm going to give an overview of four of the major developments depicted in the tree. First, the step from ENIAC to EDVAC. 
also the step to the IAS computer at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. And on the other side of the Atlantic, Alan Turing's automatic computing engine, or ACE, and also the Manchester computer. I'm also going to mention the SEAC computer built in Washington, DC, the British EDSAC computer, which is positioned in the center of the tree there. And off to the left of the tree, the great German pioneer, Konrad Zuse, whose computers are most implausibly depicted as branching off from Howard Aiken's Harvard Mark I computer. I'll be mentioning these three much more briefly than they deserve, but it's a very big tree to explore in the time. First, EDVAC, and the first draft of a report on the EDVAC, one of computing history's most significant documents. One feature that Colossus and ENIAC as originally built had in common was that neither was what we now call a stored program computer. The modern convenience of storing coded instructions in a memory operating at electronic speed was entirely absent. To set up ENIAC and Colossus for a new job, their programmers had to literally rewire them by rerouting cables, moving plugs in patch panels, and resetting switches. With the enormous ENIAC, this reprogramming process could take more than a week. At the Moore School, even as ENIAC was being built, the stored program idea was the next big thing. Reprogramming would be reduced simply to loading a new program into memory. The stored program machine that the ENIAC group were eagerly envisaging was dubbed the Electronic Discrete Variable Computer, EDVAC. The question of how in the first place the stored program idea came to be under discussion at the Moore School is a tangled one. The great engineer Prez Eckert, who with John Morkley led the ENIAC project, always claimed to have thought of the idea himself whereas others at the Moore School tended to maintain that John von Neumann contributed it. Von Neumann had been brought into the Moore School computer project as a consultant around the middle of 1944, after which there were groundbreaking discussions between von Neumann, Eckert, Morkley, and others at the Moore School on high-speed memory, logical control, and coding. And in March 1945, a project report noted that, quote, Dr. von Neumann plans to submit within the next few weeks a summary of these analyses of the logical control of the, of the EDVAC, together with examples showing how certain problems can be set up, unquote. This eventual first draft of von Neumann's report caused an absolute furore because the names of Eckert and Morkley were absent from the byline. The situation proved unmendable and the ENIAC EDVAC group soon fell to pieces. The big names departed, and it was left to this young man, Kite Sharpless, to build the EDVAC. The finished EDVAC was a relative latecomer, not running until 1952. Eckert and Morkley themselves transitioned from the Moore School to the private sector, forming their electronic control company, and going on to create the BINAC and the very famous UNIVAC. Von Neumann set up his own electronic computer project at the Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. And here he is standing proudly by his Princeton computer in 1952. It contained around 2,600 vacuum tubes, about the same number as Colossus and vastly fewer than ENIAC. As the tree depicts, the IBM 701 was modeled on the Princeton IAS computer. This was IBM's first mass-produced stored program electronic computer. It was completed in 1952 and unveiled to the world in 1953. Next, Turing and the Brits. It was in 1936 that Turing published his now famous paper on computable numbers. This contained his abstract universal computing machine, now known simply as the universal Turing machine. Turing's universal machine stored instructions in its memory, and some argue that it encapsulates the logical essentials of the stored program idea. Then at Bletchley Park during the war, Turing became familiar with Colossus and the speed of operation that Flower's digital electronics made possible. At the end of the war in 1945, this man, 
John Wormersley, sought Turing out and offered him a job at London's National Physical Laboratory to design and oversee the construction of an electronic computer. By the way, there's no known photograph of Wormersley. Wormersley had read Turing's On Computable Numbers not long after it was published, and it made a big impression on him. Earlier in 1945, Wormersley had gone to check out the American computing scene. He wrote, 1945, February to May, JRW sent to the USA by director, that's the director of the National Physical Laboratory, sees Harvard machine and calls it Turing in hardware. JRW sees ENIAC and is given information about EDVAC by, John, by von Neumann and Goldstein. Wormersley had a copy of von Neumann's first draft, and he showed this to Turing, who was excited by it. And in his design document for the ACE, he said, the present report gives a fairly complete account of the proposed calculator. It is recommended, however, that it be read in conjunction with J. von Neumann's report on the EDVAC. Turing's design document shows definite traces of the influence of von Neumann's first draft. For example, in this diagram of an adder, where Turing uses von Neumann's McCulloch-Pitt-style neuron notation for representing logical circuits. Nevertheless, Turing didn't follow von Neumann's architectural proposals. Unlike von Neumann's design, Turing's computer had no central processing unit. As depicted here, the ACE had a decentralized architecture with its logical and arithmetical functions distributed among its various memory units, shown as rectangles in the diagram. Turing's ACE project certainly caught the attention of the British press. In the first of these cuttings, ACE superior to US model, that's ENIAC that the British journalist is dissing. The journalist was right, though. The ACE did have a bigger memory. A pilot model of Turing's ACE first ran in 1950. Its speed was a blazing one megahertz, exceptional for the time. This is the full-scale version of the ACE. It first ran in 1958 and was used, among other things, for early AI research. Finally, Manchester. Here, the initiator was this man, Max Newman. By Newman's own account, it was some lectures he gave on the foundations of mathematics in Cambridge in 1935 that set Turing on the course that led him to the universal machine. Then, from 1942, Newman was a code breaker at Bletchley Park, where he eventually presided over nine Colossus computers. Effectively, he was director of an electronic computing center. When the war ended, he set up a computing machine laboratory at the University of Manchester with funding from the Royal Society of London. Newman was joined there by the electronic engineers Freddie Williams and Tom Kilburn. And here they are in Newman's computing machine lab, standing in front of their creation. They called their prototype stored program computer simply Baby. That's Williams on the right. In broad terms, Williams contributed the electronic memory, and Kilburn was responsible for designing the rest of the baby computer. Kilburn's original plan was to base the baby on Turing's decentralized design, but Newman spent three months at Princeton and came back to Manchester full of the joys of von Neumann architecture. Kilburn was eventually persuaded, and with some help from Jack Good, he designed baby in the Princeton mold. This is the architecture Kilburn settled on. The diagram shows a simplified version of what von Neumann was proposing at Princeton, a machine consisting essentially of a memory and an accumulator. The largest of these three circles is the memory, a 32-line Williams tube, and the circle on the right is the accumulator, another Williams tube, and the third Williams tube over on the left is the control. 1948 was certainly a year to remember. The tiny experimental baby ran its first stored program in June 1948. And also in 1948, a renewed version of ENIAC that I call ENIAC 1948 went into operation. ENIAC 1948 was a stored program computer. 
It incorporated ideas about stored programming that had been developed before the original ENIAC EDVAC group broke up. This new setup involved a novel use of the ENIAC's function tables. These were resistance networks designed originally to hold numerical constants. Eckert had designed them based on ideas of Jan Reichmann at RCA. Here's Dick Klippinger, one of the ENIAC group, explaining the new idea. Klippinger says, I discovered a new way to program the ENIAC, which would make it a lot more convenient. I became aware of the fact that one could get a pulse out of the function table and put it on the program trays. This led me to invent a way of storing instructions in the function table. Von Neumann also contributed to this plan by simplifying the three address code Klippinger had originally proposed so that only one address was needed. The NEX function tables were not exactly an ideal way to implement stored programming. As memory devices, they were rather slow, and moreover, they were read-only. Nevertheless, ENIAC 1948 was a vast improvement over the original ENIAC, and the computer gave sterling service until it was dismantled in 1955. Finally, here's a timeline to tie things together. In 1936, Turing's on computable numbers. Then during 1936 to 1938, Zuse in Germany independently considers the stored program idea. The ultra-secret Colossus in 1944, ENIAC in 1945, ENIAC 1948 and the Manchester Baby. In 1949, Maurice Wilkes's EDVAC type EDSAC runs in Cambridge, England. In 1950, SIAC, the first EDVAC type computer to run in the US, designed and built in DC by Ralph Slutz and Sam Alexander. In the UK, Pilot Ace, Princeton Computer, and finally, EDVAC. One fascinating and hotly debated question is whether Turing's ideas influenced von Neumann's thinking about computer design as well as vice versa. And Zhao is going to mention this aspect briefly. Over to you, Zhao. Thank you, Jack. Both Turing and von Neumann understood very clearly the huge significance of the developments set in motion at the Moore School and the other centers of earlier work on computers. By 1955, von Neumann was saying, it is astonishing to what extent the use of the computing machine has spread, and in some fields today, it is very hard to imagine how one would go on walking without such machines. Jack mentioned von Neumann's influence on Turing. What about influence in the other direction? Did the Turing also influence von Neumann? Was von Neumann even familiar with the ideas in Turing's 1936 paper when he was thinking about the store program computers? From documents dated 1946 and later, we know that von Neumann understood Turing's uncomputable numbers very well by that time. These are examples of von Neumann's remarks on Turing and the universal machine from this period. In 1946, he wrote to the pioneer of cybernetics, Norbert Wiener, saying, the great positive contribution of Turing, Kumpis, and McCulloch is that even one definite mechanism can be universal. In a lecture in Pasadena in 1948, von Neumann said, he introduced and analyzed the concept of a universal automaton. Then in a lecture in Illinois in 1949, he said, the importance of Turing's research is just this, that if you construct an automaton right, then any additional requirements about the automaton can be handled by sufficiently elaborate instructions. But was von Neumann familiar with the contents of uncomputable numbers before 1946? This question has been much debated. We now know that the answer is almost certainly yes. This is thanks to a terrific archival fund by my fellow panelist, Mark Priestley. In the archives of the American Philosophical Society, he came across an 18-page typescript of three lectures by von Neumann on high-speed computing. This is the first page of this fascinating document. The document is undated, but the lectures concern the ENIAC and its planned successor, the EDVAC. 
Here is the first page of lecture three. In this lecture, von Neumann discussed the Turing machine. At the start of the lecture, he emphasized the role of logic in developing an electronic computer. He said, the problem of developing a computing machine can be considered as a problem in logic. The lecture's central focus was what von Neumann called the problem of logical control. As he explained in his first draft, the logical control of the device, that is, the proper sequencing of its operations, can be most efficiently carried out by a central control organ. Having introduced the problem of logical control, von Neumann moved immediately to a discussion of what he called the logical machine of Turing. After a brief introduction to Turing machines, von Neumann turned to the universal Turing machine. An important feature of this TypeScript is that it contains a prominent mention of the universal Turing machine. Here is what he said. A universal machine is one which can construct any arithmetic function that can be done by a particular Turing machine. Common sense might say that a universal machine is impossible, but Turing proves that it is possible. The idea of a universal machine is simple and neat. To build this machine, one decides on the code to describe each particular Turing machine. Then one puts the definition of each Turing machine on a tape. The new machine reads the definition of a Turing machine and then imitates it. So that casts new light on a much discussed problem. It is very clear that von Neumann was fully aware of the universal Turing machine and in the lecture was considering it in connection with the problem of how best to design a successor to the ENIAC. There is still much more research that needs to be done concerning the extent of Turing's and von Neumann's influence on one another. In our century, von Neumann and Turing are probably the most famous of those earlier pioneers of electronic computing. And aspects of their vision back in the ENIAC era extend into our future. Turing said, this is only a foretaste of what is to come and only the shadow of what is going to be. We have to have some experience with the machine before we really know its capabilities. I do not see why it should not enter any one of the fields normally covered by the human intellect and eventually compete on equal terms. For Neumann, there is an ever accelerating progress of technology and changes in the mode of human life, which gives the appearance of approaching some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs as we know them could not continue. Turing again, we can only see a short distance ahead, but we can see plenty there that needs to be done. That is, thank you. Uh, so if, if, if the two of you are that, oh, sorry, are, Professor Copeland, are we going back to you or should we go on to uh, Dr. Priestley? No, by all means, go on. Well, in that case, thank you to both of you very much. Uh, Dr. Priestley. Okay, let me just share my screen. Okay, is that the correct visible screen now, do you think? Yes, it's visible. Okay, and you can hear me all right? Yes. Okay, so um, following on from uh, what Jack and Zheng said, I'm going to talk about um, how ENIAC was actually used at the various stages um, in its life. So I'm talking more about the programming and the applications that ENIAC was used for rather than the machine itself or its um, successors. Um, so uh, here's a picture of ENIAC, which we've already seen and we'll probably see again. Uh, the, the most significant thing about this is the sheer size of the machine. Um, the completed ENIAC was the size of a substantial room. So there are four people here working with various bits of the machine. They're actually inside ENIAC. Uh, around the walls of this room, you can see various units, functional units, which performed simple tasks like addition, uh, multiplication, division, control, things like that. Um, the full machine is was eight feet high, so it looks like the machine is roughly the same height as the uh, head of that person in the foreground. In fact, it goes all the way up to the roof. So it was a truly colossal machine containing 17, 18,000 um, vacuum tunes, many hundreds of switches and uh, many hundreds of connections. Um, ENIAC was programmed. Well, they, they didn't use the word programming in those days for um, 
in, in the first version of ENIAC for, for making it do something. They talked about setting it up to run a problem because the way you set it up was to physically reconfigure it. It had in that picture, you can see the banks of switches which had to be set to um, specify particular operations you wanted to carry out. And you can see the woman in the front is wire, physically wiring um, two bits of the machine together. Uh, the wiring essentially controlled the order in which the various operations set up, whereas the individual operations were set up by turning those switches, which you can see uh, just above her left hand. And the, uh, the woman in the background, is her, her hand is kind of roughly where the switches are. So setting the machine up uh, took, as Jack said, um, hours, if not days, to complete a setup for a new problem. And it was this very physical, hand, literally hands-on process of uh, setting switches and um, plugging connections between the various units. Um, obviously, you don't make a machine that size without having some idea about how you are going to, um, to do that. And back in 1943, when the ENIAC project just got started, one of the first things they did actually was to think about how it was going to be used. The initial um, app planned application for the ENIAC was to compute the trajectory of a shell coming out of an artillery, um, a uh, new form of artillery. Uh, it was built for the US Ordnance um, Department, who in the war were developing at, at an incredible range of new artillery, new weapons. And before these machines could be used in war, they had to they had to be supplied with the kind of user manual, which said you know how you how you aimed the thing. And in order to produce this, uh, these firing tables, which told you how the new artillery was going to be used, um, the Ordnance Department had to do a huge amount of computation to work out the trajectories of shells leaving these new guns. And the ENIAC was sponsored in order to speed up the process of making these firing tablets, so it, it, firing tables. So its basic original application was to compute the trajectories of shells. Um, and in 1943, even before the machine was fully designed, uh, these two people, Adele Goldstein and Arthur Burks, made a, uh, a a sort of draft layout saying how ENIAC could be done to um, could be used to compute one of these trajectories. And one of the main reasons they did this was just to work out how big the machine needed to be in order to be able to compute a trajectory. They didn't want to build ENIAC and discover it was too small, so it was quite important to kind of at least in a preliminary way, um, make this program in 1943, doing a lot of paperwork um, to work out how ENIAC was going to do this computation. And on the right there is uh, an illustration of the, a part of the diagram they came up with um, in 1943 to do that. And you can see it's basically a kind of schematic picture of ENIAC showing how the plugging was, to, how the switching was to be done and how the plugging was supposed to be done. Uh, ENIAC was completed towards the end of 1945. Um, and they started and then they began to think about how they were going to program it, how they were going to use it in practice. And one of the start one of the interesting things about this, which was really kind of hidden in the first 50 years of people discussing ENIAC as a machine, was the role of women in, in, in programming and using and setting up ENIAC. Um, a lot of work has been done on these famous six women who um, started out, they, they, they were originally employed by the Ordnance Department as human computers, doing these calculating these trajectories by hand. And then they were selected to become operators, ENIAC operators. Um, there's a little bit of controversy about that. Their job description was operators, but it should be stressed that what they were actually doing was much more like what we would call programming these days. In a sense, they were kind of ex machine experts uh, who knew all about the ENIAC, how it worked and how to use it. And they mediated between kind of like scientists who came along to ENIAC with a problem and the machine itself. They worked out how to actually set up these computations on the ENIAC in, in an efficient way. Uh, and also how to debug them when they went wrong, as and of course they did. Um, also, two notable uh, women involved with ENIAC were Adele Goldstein, who was the wife of Hermann Goldstein, who was kind of von Neumann's sidekick in um, in both, uh, well, certainly later when he went to um, the Institute of Advanced Studies machine, and Clara von Neumann, who was von Neumann's wife, and who was uh, important in the use of ENIAC later on. Uh, the first ENIAC application was run between December 45 and February 46 for Los Alamos, the Manhattan Project. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of influence here between um, the Manhattan Project and ENIAC um, because of von Neumann's connection with both. Um, uh, but the very first problem that ENIAC ran at the end of 1945 was the solution of some equations for uh, Los Alamos. Uh, the project was directed by Stanley Frankel and Nicholas Metropolis there. Um, the 
the right hand side of that screen is an extract from the ENIAC service lab service log uh, illustrating that something going wrong and something being fixed. Uh, the interesting thing here is it shows the handwriting at the top of Prez Eckert and at the bottom of um, John Morkley, uh, the two ENIAC, principal ENIAC designers and the chief engineer. Um, so, and, and this first application was, it was um, the first time ENIAC had been used in anger. It was a really kind of ambitious calculation to use as like a, 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 a pr the first calculation. And they also used it as a way of kind of actually debugging ENIAC uh, as well as the calculation itself. But it was successful and it kind of took several months to run this program. Um, throughout the rest of 1946, well, of course, the war finished. So the Ordnance Department didn't really need firing tables anymore because they weren't producing new artillery. So it's a funny kind of period in ENIAC's life because in a way they weren't quite sure what to do with the machine. Um, so they they used it for, it was used for a number of sort of a, mis a miscellany of applications. Uh, one of which, and perhaps the best known of which was run by uh, an English mathematician and physicist, Douglas Hartree, who had visited, along with Womersley, had visited ENIAC in 1945 before it was complete and was invited back in 1946 um, to run a problem, to run one of his problems on the machine. Um, and hopefully, I think they wanted to generate publicity to kind of motivate the staff and to generate publicity for the machine. Um, so in sort of May 1946, um, Hartree visited, stayed several weeks in Philadelphia, ran this problem on um, ENIAC. The details are not terribly important, but what's nice about these quotes is how um, Hartree thanks um, Kathleen McNulty in the bottom left-hand corner there for instruction, advice, and help in organizing the work for the machine, planning the machine set up for it, and running the machine, which gives a nice description of the job that these women actually did in practice, um, liaising with um, scientists like Hartree who were using the machine to solve their problems. For her part, um, Kathleen McNulty, who ended up being John Morkley's second wife, as it happens, uh, described Hartree as being a complete delight to work with in every way. So that was the sort of thing that was going on in 1946, a variety of people running a variety of applications. In 1947, um, the Manhattan Project, well, not, not, it wasn't the Manhattan Project then, but Los Alamos was moving on to develop um, bigger and more powerful um, atomic weapons. And in early 1947, von Neumann and Stanley Ulam, a Polish mathematician at Los Alamos, came up with a statistical technique called Monte Carlo for um, simulating uh, what would going on in a kind of like chain reactions inside uranium nucleuses. And so this is a report von Neumann wrote with collaboration with Ulam called Statistical Methods in Neutron Diffusion. And basically it became known as the Monte Carlo method. And it's a way of applying statistics to basically simulate um, chain reactions. Um, so von Neumann uh, came up with this scheme, made a computational setup for a particular application of it, which um, Herman and Adele Goldstein then produced uh, an ENIAC setup for it. So we're in kind of March 1947 at this point. And you'll notice that von Neumann says at the bottom of the screen, uh, this application will exhaust about 80, 90% of ENIAC's programming capacity. So they're being ambitious here. They're trying to use ENIAC to um, do applications that are maybe kind of larger than it was originally intended for. Um, and at this point, something quite, as, as Jack sort of suggested earlier on, something quite exciting happens. Uh, since 1945, since, well, since 1944, the ENIAC group had been developing plans for a second machine called the EDVAC. Uh, John von Neumann joined the group as a consultant in 1944. And in the first half of 1945, produced this report called the draft report, uh, first draft of a report on the EDVAC. Controversial document, uh, came, it was issued under John von Neumann's name only, but obviously it was meant to be a summary of the, the work of the entire group. But not only, it was not just a question of building the machine, this new machine also required a new technique of programming. You didn't, you couldn't, you, the EDVAC was not to be programmed by setting switches and plugging machines. It was to be programmed by writing code in a way that was much more familiar, would be familiar to people nowadays. So this was like the first machine, uh, first modern machine where you would sit down and write sort of just you know, machine code or binary code that would express the program. You wouldn't need to physically reconfigure the machine to, um, to run a new program. So in 1947, John von Neumann and Hermann Goldstein published the first of a series of reports on this new style of programming. They called it planning and coding of problems for an electronic computing instrument. 
They were specifically talking about the, the machine they were building for the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton, but the ideas and the techniques um, applied to all the other machines that Jack was talking about, um, the, new, the new generation of machines, which were programmed by basically kind of paperwork, as Turing called it, rather than by plugging and coding. So we've got, on the one hand, um, generating the the architecture and the hardware for a new machine, and on the on the, on the, on the on, excuse me, on the other hand, generating a new way of programming for these new machines. And um, von Neumann, together with Clippinger, exactly who contributed what to this discussion is somewhat uncertain and controversial, but they decided that it was possible to um, use ENIAC to um, essentially to simulate one of these new style of machines. So um, they used ENIAC essentially to interpret or, or, or run one of the one of these codes uh, and that would be, we, they were designing for the EDVAC style machines. Uh, this was this would have two advantages. It would make the ENIAC's programming capacity larger and it would make the machine easier to set up. You wouldn't have to do all that plugging and switching. You could just uh, put the coded, coded instructions on the function table as Jack showed and then run the program that way. So this scheme for generating a kind of machine code for the um, ENIAC was worked on by a number of people, um, Adele Goldstein, Betty Jean Jennings in a photograph there, Nick Metropolis who programmed ENIAC earlier and Clara von Neumann all worked on this. And this, the thing on the right there is a kind of later ENIAC documentation basically showing how the, the fetch execute cycle of a stored program computer would be set up on the ENIAC. Um, and von Neumann's Monte Carlo pro problem, the, the one about simulating uh, neutron, neutron diffusion in chain reactions, became a test bed for the new style of programming. So throughout late 1947, a group of people worked on how to um, set up this Monte Carlo problem on the ENIAC using this new style of programming. And one of the significant things there was that they used flowcharts. Um, so the von Neumann re Goldstein report was basically the place where the flowchart technique for programming was first sort of publicized and um, documented. Um, by the end of the year, they would produced this really quite large and complicated um, flow diagram showing how to set up you know, a flow diagram for the Monte Carlo calculation, which they would then do um, apply to, 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 to ENIAC. Um, in the first, beginning of 1948, uh, Nick Metropolis and Clara von Neumann worked on the actual coding of the Monte Carlo program. And in April and May 1948, uh, the first run of that program took place um, uh, quite successfully. Obviously, there were teething problems, uh, programming errors, ENIAC errors, and all sorts of things. But they got some useful results. And it was successful enough that over the next couple of years, they run, uh, they run a number of um, other um, runs of the same computations with different sort of data to simulate different um, conditions within the, the nucleus. So uh, we have, as an example, there of code from the, the second run, which took place in September 1948. So, um, uh, so, that, uh, so ENIAC, and, ENIAC and innovation. So Jack sort of hinted at this. Um, ENIAC was obviously not designed as a stored program computer. It was designed in 1943. And the stored program idea was introduced to the group or the group came up with it uh, later on in sort of 44, 45. But in 1947-48, um, ENIAC was set up to simulate a stored program computer. Um, uh, they didn't, um, they couldn't do a, they didn't decided it wasn't worthwhile to implement the full um, stored program idea on ENIAC because ENIAC had a very small amount of read-write memory. Um, it could have been done in principle if you imagine an ENIAC that you know had much more um, useful memory than it did. Uh, but they 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 took taking into account ENIAC's um, hardware limitations, they set up this code so that it could be used almost as if it was a stored program computer like the EDVAC. Um, and so it, this Monte Carlo run in April May 1948, I mean it was neck and neck with the Manchester machine, but the the the, the ENIAC one was probably the first time this new style of programming was used anywhere. Uh, and certainly for a, a substantial application. The Manchester machine, on the other hand, was the first time that I think that a machine that was designed, specifically designed to be a stored program, uh, ran an application. So as Jack said, April, May 1948 was a very significant uh, moment where um, 
this new style of programming, the new machines, the new style of programming uh, came into operation for the first time in various um, in various ways in various various places in the world. And we can certainly be happy, I think, to answer question more questions on that later on. Uh, ENIAC carried on being used in its converted form until the end of its life in 1955. It had significant other later applications, including the first computerized weather simulations. And um, I think I don't think I've contributed a list of publications yet, but I did co-author a book called um, ENIAC in Action, which is available for MIT Press, which um, goes into a lot more detail about what I've been talking about and also about the later life um, of ENIAC and, and what it was used for. So um, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. And thank you so much. Um, thank you. And we'll now go to Professor Rojas. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm going to share my screen. Let, let me see if I can do that. Um, my screen. Okay, so I hope you can see my, my, my screen now. And uh, I'm going to go into more detail uh, about uh, the hardware architecture of the ENIAC. And I wanted to start with this. Uh, there are four important developments until 1939, until before the Second World War, that determine how computers will be designed uh, until 1945. And I think it's worth to review them. Uh, the first uh, important development are Hollerith machines, so punch card machines. And uh, you know that they were invented at the end of the 19th century. They were used for census, uh, for statistics. So you could uh, punch the data of a person in, in a punch card, and then the machine would select, uh, for example, persons according to, to their, their sex or according to the job they had. And then you, can, you, you could count that number of persons. And the program was not really a program in the sense that we talk about programs today, but was just the the hard wiring of the Hollerit machine. And um, I, I'm starting with these uh, Hollerit machines because they were used together with accumulators. So you had the punch cards, where you had the data for every person that you were interviewing for the census, for example. Then the Hollerit machine would do a selection according to the fields in the punch card. And then you had an accumulator where uh, the number of cards with a certain characteristic would be accumulated. And it's important to, to say that all computing machines, starting with the first calculators, uh, even the Pascal calculator or the, the calculators built in Germany around the, the, the same time that Pascal built his uh, machines, were based on the concept of an accumulator. That means years that could store numbers as they were arriving to those uh, to those accumulators. This is a picture of uh, the Mark I built at Harvard and presented in 1945. And I mentioned this machine because it's also based on the concept of the accumulator. The Harvard uh, Mark I had 72 decimal accumulators. And those are two design ideas which are typical for the time. So first is uh, the idea of using the decimal system for the internal and external representation so that there is no break between what the machine is doing inside and what the machine is presenting to the human operator. And uh, also since uh, the Harvard Mark I was based on components used for Hollerit machines, then it was um, natural to use the concept of an accumulator in order to structure the machine. This is the, the main architecture of the machine. So you have the 72 accumulators, and then you have an output line and an input line for the accumulators. And the programming was done like uh, is shown on the right side. So you would say from which accumulator is the output coming. So uh, accumulator number 20 is putting its output on this uh, bus the connecting all accumulators. And then uh, the output of accumulator 20 is going to accumulator 30. So it's the input for accumulator 30. And then you could you could send the contents of accumulator 31 as output uh, to be transformed into the input of accumulator 45 and so on. And there are many algorithms that you can 
implement using this kind of uh, accumulator approach. So you are just uh, shuffling data from one accumulator to the other. You can clear the accumulator so that you can start from zero. Then you can also implement uh, multiplication using accumulators. So there are many ways of programming these machines. But the accumulator was the essential concept that was used uh, in the Mark I architecture. And as we saw in the picture shown by Jack about uh, the pilot ACE, also the Turing machine, the, the, I mean the pilot ACE machine or the ACE machine was based on the concept of an accumulator. There is another development, which is also important to understand the architecture of the ENIAC, which are the so-called differential analyzers built in the US uh, before there were computers. They were used to solve differential equations, and you can see one of these differential analyzers here. Um, so the idea was that you could uh, have this mechanical device representing in an analog way the structure or the, the chaining of differential equations, and then integrators would uh, integrate some part of the differential equation and pass the result to the next integrator and then to the next integrator so that there is a data flow. There is a data flow. The last operation that uh, you execute in this analog machine starts the next operation automatically. And so the computation goes from one set of different of integrators to the next set and to the next set and so on. So the data flow is very important in this differential analysis ba based on integrators for solving um, differential equations. So the other development is, of course, mechanical calculators. They, they were based on years. They were based on, on, on the decimal system. And these calculators were originally based on complete years, like, for example, the machine built by Charles Babbage or designed by Charles Babbage in Cambridge was based on the idea of having years that could represent numbers by the position of the years. But uh, at the end of the 19th century, there is another way of uh, representing decimal numbers using years, and that's uh, the concept of the pinwheel. That's something that was developed uh, or was invented by Leibniz, I think, uh, but was used in the 19th century for building uh, me mechanical calculators. So by setting this, uh, this red part in the, in the pinwheel, you can determine if the pinwheel is going to have one, two, or three, or more two teeth. And so when you, for example, set up the, the year to have three teeth or to have five teeth, by doing one complete, re complete revolution of this uh, wheel, you can transmit three pulses or you can transmit five pulses. So that's the idea, that uh, you can represent the number three by the number of teeth that, that you have in your wheel. And when you rotate that year, then you give off that number as a number of pulses that you transmit to the next uh, computing element in your machine. And then digital logic, that's the fourth development I wanted to mention. Digital logic was, I think, well understood at the beginning of the 20th century, but it was Klaus Shannon who did the first written symbolic analysis of relay and switching circuits. Uh, practitioners were using them. Konrad Suse was using uh, relays in, in Germany in 1936. George Tibbets was also building his uh, series of computers using relays uh, uh, around this time, or he started around this time. But it was Klaus Shannon who made the first symbolic analysis of all these uh, developments in, in uh, logic theory. And now if you take all of these developments, if you take the concept of the accumulators, if you take the concept of a data flow machine, if you take the concept of pinwheels and giving up pulses so that uh, the next uh, computing element in your chain can absorb these pulses and you take digital logic, then you have the ENIAC. That's what explains much of the architecture of the ENIAC. So let me show you some of the elements that build the ENIAC. This picture, we have seen this picture many times. So there were constant, there were card readers, there were printers, and there were accumulators in the machine. In total, uh, the ENIA had 30 different units and 20 accumulators. The accumulators were used in much the same way as we saw for the, for the Mark I, with the difference that there was no fixed 
data bus and uh, or fixed synchronization bus. I'm using this uh, just to illustrate the idea, but uh, in a sense, you have the accumulators. So you have all these units that are going to pass numbers from one to the other. For that, you have special lines that can pass the numbers from one accumulator to the other. And you have other type of uh, connections that uh, synchronize the accumulator. So that, that's a data flow concept. I, when one unit is finished and then the next unit is activated by a pulse coming from, from the, the other unit. Uh, one thing that I find very interesting is that even if the ENIAC was an electronic machine and it was based uh, on, it had flip-flops and it had everything that we need for digital logic, what the inventors of the ENIAC did was actually represent the pinwheel using, using flip-flops. So in this machine, in the ENIAC, you would send pulses and then the accumulator would just count the pulses and with uh, the lamps and on the accumulators will advance, for example, from zero to nine until you had a representation for this number in your accumulator. If you uh, pass another pulse to the accumulator, then you had a carry to the next position and then the, um, and then the next uh, the next uh, line of lamps would, would start counting. So this is actually a digital representation of a pinwheel. So I call that a digital pinwheel. And, and um, there has been much uh, uh, controversy about, about why the, the inventors of the ENIAC didn't go for a full binary uh, design. And instead of that, they used the, the decimal system inside the every accumulator. And I read uh, somewhere that uh, they wanted to have the decimal system because that would make the debugging of the machine easier. And it would make, make maybe also the programming of the machine easier when the programmers or operators were trying to find uh, to find mistakes in the program. So um, the units were wired, as we saw in other pictures. And then uh, the idea was that uh, one pulse would start, for example, the accumulator to the left. The accumulator would, to the left would send its constant contents to another accumulator. And when this accumulator was uh, finished, the first accumulator on the, on the left, it would start the next uh, accumulators in the chain of accumulators. So that, for example, this 100 would be sent to the next uh, accumulator to be accumulated. And so the, what the programmers had to do was to wire all of these um, connections. And uh, the, fr the front panel for the accumulators in the ENIAC had uh, different kinds of uh, inputs. You had receiving ports for absorbing uh, pulses from the digital trunks coming from other accumulators. There were transmitting ports, and there were two kinds of transmitting ports. One port for sending the number in the accumulator to be added, or one port for sending the number in the, in the accumulator to be subtracted. In that case, instead of sending the number in the accumulator, the tens complement representation of the number would be sent to the next accumulator to be added in the classical way when you use a tens complement representation. And there were also several switches that could make the accumulator, for example, to send its contents not once, but twice or three times or four times so that um, you could send a multiple of uh, the number in the accumulator, for example, in this case, seven times. So by using all these possibilities, you could uh, wire the accumulators here. Uh, the, the, I'm sorry, showing an example where you want to, to compute A minus B, B plus uh, constant, C plus two B plus uh, that constant. Then we wire three accumulators. First, we wire the transmission of the data from one accumulator to the other one. So for example, for A minus B, the accumulator containing B has to send through the subtraction port its contents to the accumulator four, where it will be subtracted from the contents of A. And at the same time, if we want to do B plus the constant 359, we, send, we have to send that uh, B to the next accumulator number six, and the constant transmitter has to provide the constant 350, 59, so that in this accumulator we, have, we can have the next computation and so on. 
And of course, you have to wire the synchronization between the different accumulators so that there is at first an initial pulse coming from the initiating unit. And after that initiating pulse, then all the accumulators self-synchronize and continue with the chain, with the change of uh, computations. So I think that uh, this is very important because uh, there was no software as we saw. There was no software in the, in the ENIAC. The, the, it was pure hardware in the sense that everything had to, to be connected. And software only came as, uh, up to a point until ENIAC 1948, when the, when the constants uh, table was used for programming the machine. Now, um, I wanted to show you something the, which uh, was known in Germany in, in, in 1936, but first I just wanted to mention that uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, they had this project to put the ENIAC on a chip that was done um, several years ago at, the, beginning, at uh, the turn of the century. And uh, they put everything that, uh, that was inside the, the, the big ENIAC in, in, in a single chip. And they presented that chip at the University of Pennsylvania. We also, at the same time, or more or less at the, the same the same years, we did a, a big simulation of the ENIAC uh, using computer screens. And here, the idea was that by using a pen, a computer pen, you could wire the ENIAC as was uh, done in when the ENIAC uh, was being programmed. And then you could write your own programs, or I mean, you could connect your own programs for the ENIAC by doing these connections. And uh, it was not full size because we did not have enough computer screens, but it gave you an idea of the how the computer was programmed and how it felt to wire the ENIAC for computations. So this is the work I wanted to mention at the end. Uh, it was the work, the work done by Konrad Suse in Berlin from 36 to 38. This was a mechanical computer, the so-called uh, C1. It was mechanical. But I wanted to show it to you because it breaks with uh, the history, the long history of building accumulator machines. This is a register architecture, and it's remarkable for the time, 1936, that uh, Suse decided not to use accumulators, but to use registers. If you if you look at uh, this design, you have here two um, two arithmetical and logical units, one for the exponent of the numbers and one for the mantissa. So this is a floating point machine using two registers. Register number one is for one of the arguments in an arithmetical operation. Register number two is for the second argument. And then the contents of the arguments uh, of the register, uh, register are passed through the addition units. And then you can recycle using the, the buses that you see here. You can recycle the contents of um, or the, 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 the result of the operation that can go to, a, to register one or register two, and then you can continue computing. This is a clean break with a long history of accumulator machines. This opens the, 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 the period where uh, people will start building register-based architectures. And so in the history of computing, I think we have these two forces that play a big role. The force of evolution, evolving your design so that you use the elements that were used in the past, like accumulators, used many years before computers were designed. And you have the role of revolution, where someone comes and transforms completely the way that uh, computing elements or machines were being built uh, until then. So with this, I, I finish my presentation. Thank you very much. And we can go to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. And questions, that means you, the audience, you should be putting stuff into the chat and the Q&A buttons, but I'll start things rolling. Um, intellectual infrastructure, which is to say you have these earlier articles by Turing et al. How much is the specialization in the theory that will make computers possible actually concentrated in the United Kingdom and the United States? Or how much is it actually a broader community, uh, you know, Italy, France, Russia, Japan? And if it is concentrated in the United Kingdom and the United States, why? 
Well, a lot was in not. Germany, of course. Um, thanks to Zuza. It's certainly not exclusively the United States and the UK. So it, is there, well, then a German, so is there the German quest for a computer going on? In, in fact, is the United, is the advantage of the United Kingdom, the United States, a matter of your superior available resources at the crucial time? Well, Zuza got quite a long way, of course, with the Z3 and the Z4. Um, yeah, and... maybe maybe I can say something about that. I think that uh, um, there were in Europe many many important developments before uh, before Turing, like for example in logic. So just just uh, symbolic logic. So we had the developments uh, done by Bull in in in, in the UK. And also the developments by Frege and Hilbert and other uh, researchers in, or mathematicians in, in, in Germany. So I think that uh, logic by itself advanced at the same pace in, in many different countries. And then, um, for example, Konrad Suse started investigating logic and building his machines, trying to, to approach everything from the point of view of binary logic. But then we had the war in, in the middle. And the fact is that although very important work was done in Germany, it was uh, it was completely unknown until after the war. So especially the machines built by Konrad Suse were, uh, he started before the war in 1936, but the machines were just uh, the, the prototypes built by an entrepreneur. He was the first one to start a computer company in the world. That's something that should be said. But uh, at the same time, you, you had the war and nobody knew uh, during the war about his machines. And then after the war, many years passed until these machines were rediscovered. And in the meantime, a lot has had been written about the American and the, and the British machines. So that is also a question of what happened during the war. Yes, I think, but, I think um, you shouldn't forget that the um, both the Colossus and the ENIAC, which were like the prototype large-scale electronic computers, were both designed as war war products, Colossus for code breaking and ENIAC for artillery calculations. Uh, and the stimulus that the war gave to, to actually making these machines, turning these machines from, you know, theoretical ideas to practice uh, shouldn't be underestimated. And um, brutally, um, the UK and the US were the only countries really in, in a position to do that. Uh, obviously, the exception there is Russia, or the Soviet Union, as, as it then was. Um, maybe somebody else knows, but as far as I, I, I'm not aware of any computer developments going on in the Soviet Union, at least until after the war. I'm not sure if anyone else knows about that. But just, just returning to Zuza, um, who, who is one of my great heroes. Um, it's it's certainly true that his his machines were were um, very little known in the anglophone world and and not until you know much later, um, but uh, not long after the end of the Second World War, the Z4 was the centre of Europe's first co um, commercial computing centre at ETH Zurich, um, you know, with scientific problems being sent in and uh, the the computer being used to solve them and send the results out to the universities and um, uh, corporations that had sent the problems in. Um, zoos have got a, a remarkably long way um, and all on the basis of electromechanical technology, um, no vacuum tubes. Well, then a complimentary question perhaps. What is needed in terms of the machine tools, the industry, the parts needed to make a computer, in effect, how much did the building of the computer also require the parallel building of a computer industry to even make it possible? And how much was it building on prior industries which could be converted to the purpose? I, I think, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to say that uh, I think the, the, the story of uh, the Mark I at Harvard is a good example of how you start with, with the components that are that are there and components that were produced by industry, in this case by IBM. So IBM was not a computer company when the Harvard Mark I was built. Uh, IBM 
uh, was making cash registers and was making Hollerith machines and many other kind of devices. And uh, the developers of the Mark I, they got the main architectural design from Harvard, uh, but uh, they decided to use their own components. They decided to use accumulators coming from the Hollerith machines. And that's what I was mentioning, that uh, most of the time you don't have a clear break with the past in the history of technology. You have, you have what you have at, at the moment that you start designing something new, but then you tend to use the components of the technology that you had before. And then the, the really break, the real break with the past come to, comes after a few years, after people realize we don't have to be doing simulations of years, for example, in the ENIAC. We can do full binary computers like the ETSAC, which is based on, on it's a full binary design. And it's a serial design so that you can save a lot of uh, uh, vacuum tubes when you are building the machine instead of having to use so many thousands of vacuum tubes and have even more power. So I think these two forces, evolution and revolution, are the two ones guiding innovation. In, in this field. An interesting connection is the um, the importance of the telephone industry to, to these early computers. I mean, we've seen the examples of uh, Stibitz and Shannon, both of whom worked for Bell Labs, of course, um, and the, the kind of electromechanical relay technology of um, telephone switchboards contributed a lot to an understanding of how kind of digital logic would work, I think. And of course, in um, in the UK, the the Colossus was built and designed and built by um, engineers from the from the General Post Office, telephone engineers from the Post Office, who had, I mean, Tommy Flowers was, uh, I think, known as a an innovator for um, using electronic um, switching technology in the telephone industry, which gave him the confidence to apply that technology to to computers for the Colossus. Actually, looking forward, by the way, when does computer engineer become an actual professional subdiscipline? I would say probably in the 1950s, but I'm I'm a software guy, me. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, question then for the history and the archives. Um, by the way, and I'm encouraging people who do put put in your comments into chat. I merely ask questions in, in default. How much of this was classified? In effect, how much of the history of the computer has had to be revised because some crucial documents were initially classified and then became declassified at a later point? Well, with, with Colossus, um, stuff remained classified until very late. It wasn't really until 2000 that the, the kind of full story of the um, the German Tunney machine and the attack on it using Colossus and the various other machines that they had at Bletchley Park um, got into the public domain. Um, ENIAC was initially classified, of course, but, um, uh, you know, they, they very sensibly decided to announce it to the press in 1946. Um, uh, so cl cl classification did play some role, but um, for most, most of the projects, a, a lot of documents were... Uh, were available quite early on for historians. Yes, I think I think in during the war they were very careful to um, restrict access to information about ENIAC and Ed, EDZAC, ENIAC and EDVAC. Um, there's a kind of story that um, the EDVAC first draft of the EDVAC was widely circulated. I'm not sure that's true actually. I think they were pretty careful about it. Um, but as Jack says, in, in um, February '46. Um, the ENIAC was kind of made public announced and declassified and von Neumann claimed um, that here part part of his motivation in those years was to ensure that computer technology became um, circulatable as, as part of a kind of general scientific knowledge rather than being a, 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 a confidential military technology so possibly von Neumann has a role there in making it non-secret and, and related to the non-secret, though, how about um, the, the rights to do the, the patents and so on? How much of this, were, were there any bottlenecks in developing computers because of limited patent rights? How much of it, you know, in effect, once the principles are in the public domain, anybody can come up with their own version? But is there, I guess, a commercial law story here also in the early development of the computer? Well, yeah, yeah I mean, one of the enormous controversies about the ENIAC to EDVAC um, transition was that 
uh, Eckert and Morkley, who were, had, had kind of commercial interests, and they want they set they they left the ENIAC project to set up a commercial computing building firm in Philadelphia, uh, and they wanted obviously wanted to keep it as a kind of sort of the intellectual property that they had from the ENIAC. So one of the most controversial things about the EDVAC report that um, was that it was public, it, it went out without any security classification, even though it was a report on a confidential project. And then there was some the various sides took legal advice in 1947, I think, and they were advised that the um, the fact that the EDVAC report had been circulated meant that you could no longer claim uh, patents on the material that it described. So it was very you know, painful, controversial, and of course there was a there was a much there was a much later um, patent case in the 70s involving the ENIAC, uh, where I forget I forget maybe some, maybe. Jack, maybe somebody else knows the details, but Sperry, Rand, and Honeywell. Or it, it, it's a famous case between Sperry, Rand, and Honeywell, um, whether people could claim, con, basically claim um, patent rights over the electronic computer based on on this work on the ENIAC. And eventually, the decision was no, probably because if, if the decision had been yes, it would have stymied the entire computer industry at that stage, which in 1970 was not something you wanted to do. So. Um, so yeah, obviously a hugely a hugely important topic, but um, you know because of the I think the slightly confusing situation at the end of the war, an awful lot of the ideas were not patented. I mean the you know, details of individual technologies obviously were, but the the basic principles of the computer were in the public domain from a very early date, and I understand I'm not a legal expert, but that's that's my understanding. And Dr. Von Neumann was, von Neumann was <laughs> completely unrepentant about. Um, you know, the, the EDVAC report being, uh, um, you know, put out into the public domain, um, probably against Eckert and Morkley's wishes, you know, because they, they wanted to uh, patent it and putting the report out into the public domain um, kind of frustrated them. Um, and I, I, br I brought along von Neumann's deposition. It's, it's a, a very interesting document, I think. It's this 1947 deposition about all this. Um, and he says, um uh it was in it was intended to have the report that is the edvac report published as soon as acceptable to the contractor the university of pennsylvania and its representatives in order to further the development of the art of building high-speed computers um, and scientific as well as engineering subject uh thinking on this subject as widely and as early as feasible um after the report, or more precisely, what was meant to be the first part of a longer report had been completed, it was mimeographed and distributed. Um, my personal opinion was at all times and is now that this was perfectly proper and in the best interests of the United States. So some fairly strong words there from von Neumann. Hmm. Dr. Fan, I thought you were going to say something a little earlier. Uh, no, no, I'm just, I think it's, it's, it's all right. Okay. I, I want to say something um, yes. regarding uh, patents. Yes. So uh, it's an interesting part of the history of computing in Germany that Konrad Susi applied for a patent for the computer as soon as 1938 or so, something like that. He uh, tried to patent uh, first the mechanical machine then that was rejected by the patent office before the war. And then he applied in 1941 for uh, a machine, the, the, the next machine, the C3, which was built using telephone relays. So he had, he had to go to telephony components. He used rotary switches from telephone relays for the microprogramming of uh, his machine. And then the patent application of 1941 contained the following contained the concept of microprogramming, contained the concept of a floating point machine, the concept of a register machine, the concept of a memory separated from the processor, and, uh, and, and, and the concept of uh, programming the machine using some kind of instructions. But then the war came and the patent was not processed until after the war. Then the patent office in Germany was closed until after uh, the, the German Federal Republic was founded. And then it took like 10 more years or 12 more years to process the patent application. It was rejected at the beginning of the 1970s because they, they said 
well, all of this is well known by now. So we, we cannot give a patent. And also the computer companies, uh, the existing computer companies were fighting from everywhere. So IBM and Honeywell and, and Univac, they were trying to avoid that uh, a patent for the computer was given in, in Germany. And so the patent was rejected at the end, but that was the very first patent for a computer that was uh, submitted somewhere in the world. Hmm. Thank you. I am going to go to a question from the audience, which Mark Priestley has already been answering. Uh, Paul uh, asks, we know about the moth that gave rise to the notion of debugging. Are there any other interesting legends about early troubleshooting of the early computers? And well, Mark, you've already, I think, mentioned the breakpoint uh, and, and then another thing, but um, maybe you could say that out loud for the audience in general and people could answer. Uh, yeah, so obviously, um... These electronic machines allowed the, the computations you could run were so much bigger and so much more complex than anything you and so much faster than anything that could have run before that finding techniques to um, see what was going on when things went wrong uh, was super important. Um, so the ENIAC on the original ENIAC, it was the the flow of a program through the through the operations was controlled by pulses going through wires that connected um, one one part of the machine to another and to interrupt a computation at a given point you could do that simply literally by unplugging a symbol a single wire um and they i think they did actually start using the term i think that is, i think they did use that if i remember correctly that's they did actually use the term breakpoint for that um to define when the when you could do that and you could also they, they also had a little handheld device it, it looked rather like a mouse in, a, in photographs it looks a bit like a mouse but it was a device with buttons on that allowed you to um, run a program or step through it uh, one step at a time. So you could examine each step of the computation as a way of, uh, say, debugging it and seeing what was going on. Anyone else but, on uh, early? Yeah, later? I think I think uh, the name the name of the computer itself comes from ENIAC. I mean, computer was a was a job at the time. It, uh, people who who were doing computations were computers. And ENIAC, I think, was the first machine to be named a computer, and that name st stuck, and that's why we talk about computers today. Uh, it, that's not the case in every country. Uh, in France, um, when they started selling computers, IBM, they they asked a professor at La Sorbonne to uh, translate uh, the, the, the leaflet uh, for selling the computer, and the professor decided that the best translation was ordinateur, so from ordering. And so ever since then, uh, computers in, in France are ordinateurs. That's just an accident of history, but it's interesting that uh, the term computer comes from the ENIAC. Any other, anybody else on legends? I am, so I'm gonna have a question then. Is there anything in the structure of the English language which has become dominant in the structure of computer programming due to the early advantage of English speaking programmers in um, setting up computer language? Well, all programming languages are basically dialects of English. Well, not dialects of English, but they all use English keywords. Um, I suppose there are very few. It was, yeah. No, I think I mean, that the, structurally the, the, and no, you know, the terminology structurally. Yeah, the terminology in computer science is uh, dominated by English. Uh, so we speak of hardware and software in many languages, not just in English. And I, I remember that I was I, I, I was once giving a talk in, in, in Italy, in Italian, and I, I wanted to say computer mouse. And I said uh, Topolino, which is the, the Italian for, for mouse. And everybody laughed at, in the auditorium. And I asked, why are you laughing? And they told me because uh, uh, a computer mouse in Italy is a mouse. <laughs> Whether it gave, whether English um, kind of you know left left a, a significant imprint on computer languages though, um, I mean that's less clear given that the languages were kind of logic based, um, and so more universal. Well, there were there were languages later on languages like COBOL, weren't there, which were intended to allow business people to talk about programs in some approximation of business English. Um, what 
difference that would have made if they'd been talked about business French. I don't really know. Possibly. <laughs> Okay, this is merely my alternate life as a, a linguist uh, coming through clearly. Um, <laughs> World War, you, you mentioned World War II, you mentioned um, you know, civilian uses. How about, much about the Korean War in particular? How much does the, the demands of the Korean War play any role in the development of computers? And perhaps more broadly, the, the need for rearm the, the rearmament starting in you know 48, 49, Cold War rearmament. If I remember correctly, um, the Korean War was the point at which IBM seriously got into computers. And they developed, I think, the IBM 701, which I think was originally called the Defense Computer, which was like a, a, as I understand it, a sort of ruggedized or commercialized or IBMized version of the Princeton machine that von Neumann designed. Um, and I, I say this, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but my recollection is that actually that that was that was the point at which IBM seriously got into building computers. I mean, they'd obviously been sort of they were they were they weren't super fast to pick up the idea of a stored program computer. Um, I mean, in the late in at the time that ENIAC was um, operating, and at the time that the you know the British and American pioneer groups were building the first stored program computers, IBM were building this kind of monstrous machine called the Selective Sequence Electronic Computer, which was some weird, huge hybrid, you know, almost stored program in some bits, but it was like kind of five different computer paradigms thrust into one enormous machine. Um, Adele Goldstein programmed some of the Monte Carlo calculations on it, interestingly, um, but it wasn't, it wasn't a pure stored program machine, but that was what IBM were doing in the late 40s. So my understanding was it was really part, at least partly the impetus of the Korean War and presumably Tom Watson or, um, you know, maybe just the passage of time. But certainly there was a stimulus in the Korean War that I think prompted IBM to develop this defense calculator, which became the IBM 701, the first of their sequence of machines. Atomic weapons certainly provided a stimulus in in the UK uh, on the on the early machines. For example, Manchester was uh, the Manchester computer was was much used for atomic weapons calculations. Thank you. Okay. Um, I at this point see that it's three twenty five. I'm going to th therefore ask if I could ask each of you for a concluding statement. Yeah no more than a minute, say, each, after which I would do a wrap-up. Um, I guess, oh, same order. I, I always say same order or reverse order, but you know, just concluding statements uh, you know, about the subject, people stuff for people to think about. Um, Professor Copeland. Um, so, so I want to talk a bit about our, our title, um, ENIAC, the first computer. Um, but first is is kind of a difficult term in the history of computing, and not least because there's no universally accepted view of what counts as a computer, um, which is one of the most interesting things about the philosophy of computing. I think we don't we don't really know what a computer is. There are um, very different theories, um, but. In terms of history, I think it's important to dwell on the richness and intricacy and the long history of calculating machinery. Um, and may maybe this is a good moment to acknowledge a few more of the machines from that history. Um, I've, I've no objection to calling Babbage's um, mechanical difference engine a computing machine on the basis that arguably a computing machine is simply a machine that's able to do work that could be done by, by a human computer. The difference engine dripped oil as it computed, which I think is a, an absolutely wonderful image. Babbage's later analytical engine existed only in concept, but it was still glorious. And moving closer to the time of ENIAC, there was Zuzu's entirely mechanical Z1 that we saw a photo of. Um, built in the living room of his parents' Berlin apartment. It never quite worked, but it was the prototype for his electromechanical Z3 and Z4. And um, other high spots of the electromechanical era were Aiken's Harvard computer that we've heard a bit about and Stibitz's computers at Bell Labs. And the, electron the electronic era itself arrived before the Second World War, um, with a Tanisov small special purpose computer um, with around 300 vacuum tubes. 
And during the war, Tom Flowers and his engineers at Bletchley Park um, kept the place well stocked with interesting pieces of computing equipment. To mention just one, a computer-based, a capacitor-based electronic memory that they called Aquarius. And then post ENIAC, some early electronic computers that we haven't already mentioned today, but which definitely belong on the roll of honor. Uh, Jay Forrester's whirlwind computer built at MIT and working in 1951 with a single row of its, um, its eventual 32 memory tubes. Um, and then also um, down in this part of the world, I'm in New Zealand, of course, giving this talk. Um, so down here, Trevor Peirce's CIRAC computer built in Sydney. Um, CIRAC was Australia's first electronic computer. And the prototype ran a uh, program, um, uh, sorry, the, 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 uh, the prototype ran a test program in 1949, which is very early um, in the course of events. Um, computing history is such a tangled and wonderful story. It's full of heroes and full of successes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Fan. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed this workshop and learned a lot from it. Um, I just want to make a few uh, general remarks. So um, the, the rapid development of the modern computer over the years has just been amazing and incredible. Starting from innovations such as the ENIAC and other computers in the 1940s, we can now better investigate and comprehend the macro and the macro with the aid of the computers. So most, if not all fields today are relying more or less on computers, so it's our daily life. So Turing's and von Neumann's um, prophetic remarks that I referred to in our talk have already become a re reality. Our form of life has dramatically changed and this happens in less than a hundred years. So nowadays computers are becoming more and more crucial in understanding ourselves in the field of artificial intelligence. Can a machine or a computer be intelligent or conscious or less philosophically, can a computer pass the Turing test or the imitation game as Turing called it? So in, 1950, uh, in 1952, Turing predicted that it would take at least 100 years for a computer to be able to pass the test. So that is 2052. Is Turing right about this? Are we approaching the singularity that von Neumann mentioned in the foreseeable future? And what's the future of computers? I think we will have to wait and see. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Priestley. Um, I think I would just draw attention quickly to the distinction between machines and the programming. Um, a, a lot of the history of computing has been, uh, the early history of computing is about the different machines that people built. And in my, in my talk, I tried to sort of you know, draw attention to the other side, the programming side, and ENIAC's rather kind of wonderful role in being, uh, first of all, a pioneer machine, and then secondly, a kind of pioneer for the new type of machine or the new type of programming, even though that's not how it was originally designed. Um, which kind of demonstrates the flexibility of um, computers in a way that, of course, Turing um, would drew attention to on, on many occasions. I mean, there's a rather wonderful quote from there's rather a curious thing in the, in the late 40s where um, really very sophisticated people like Claude Shannon was still thinking in terms of building specific machines to do specific things. Um, uh, whereas Turing pointed out in his 1950 paper about um, the one where he, the paper where he introduces the Turing test, he said, "Well, actually, this is ridiculous. You only need one machine because it can then be programmed to do anything else." And I think the ENIAC conversion that I kind of talked about was is is, is a great example of this. You can get, you've got one digital machine, the ENIAC, which wasn't even designed as a stored program machine, but it is capable of simulating through 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 programming, um, simulating um, all these other machines, including the ones which were designed after ENIAC. So it's a wonderful sort of circular, circular, circular sort of thing. Uh, the other, the other final point I would like to say, is specifically about the ENIAC, is that I mean it, it became successful through this conversion, but a certain amount, a certain amount was lost at the same time, because the original ENIAC was a highly parallel machine, um, and people were, you know, in 1946 before it was converted, people like Douglas Lemmer were using it for experiments in programming, you know, highly, highly parallel computations, 
which of course is, is, is an avenue that was no longer possible once it was converted into into an advac type machine so some of it's some you know the ENIAC, some of NEX potentiality i think was lost in the in 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 the, in the course of the story that i told thank you Professor Rojas. Yeah, I do not have uh, too much to add. I just wanted to mention that uh, in the year 2000, we had a workshop in Berlin during the World Congress of Mathematicians. And we discussed that question, uh, which one was the first computer in the world? And we had people from the UK, from the US, from, from Germany. And the conclusion at the end was that if we want to talk about uh, the first computer, we have to talk in plural. So there is the first computers, because all of these machines that were mentioned by, by Jack and, and by Mark, they, they were machines which brought part of the concept of the computer to, 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 to make the, or to produce the full picture of what a computer is today. And so I think uh, we can talk only about the first computers in the world and then consider all these machines as wonderful examples of uh, what a computer can be. Thank you so much. So thank you all. Thank you, our panelists. Thank you, our audience. We do it for you. We can't do it without you. I'm grateful to you uh, for watching as we are grateful to our panelists for giving us stuff to watch. Um, I'll just go quickly over uh, business. Uh, one, if you liked this, consider becoming a member of the National Association of Scholars. Help support, among other things, webinars of this nature. Two, if you liked this webinar, uh, we're continuing the series. I believe the next one is in a few weeks on the microchip. Uh, check out our webpage, check out our advertisements for upcoming American Innovations webinars. We're not done yet. Um, three, if you have further questions, if a question wasn't answered, if something else occurs to you, please send me an email, randall at nas.org, R-A-N-D-A-L-L at nas.org. I'd be delighted to forward your questions to the panelists so they can have the option to answer you. And then again, if you want to see this again, if you want to show it to other people, uh, this will be up on the National Association of Scholars YouTube channel within 24 hours in perpetuity. So please forward it you know, around the world. Again, thank you all so much. Delighted um, to be able to listen. Delighted to be able to learn. Uh, take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.